Now, many of you know one of my favorite things in all of the world is chocolate. <laughs> now, if you take creation, family, I didn't say family in the other two services, and I heard about it after the 9.30, so family, <laughs> grace, God, all of those things rank higher, but folks, to be honest, chocolate's right up there. I love chocolate, milk chocolate, white chocolate, dark chocolate, salted chocolate, um, melted chocolate, <laughs> chocolate on ice cream, chocolate on bananas. You ever had chocolate on bananas? Oh, my gosh. So this morning... I'm going to share some chocolate with you. In this basket, I have chocolate bars. I have uh, chocolate with caramel in it, some from the left side and some from the right side. I have some with nuts in it. I have dark chocolate. I have chocolate covered uh, with peanut butter inside. And so I'm going to share some of it. Notice I said some of it. <laughs> 8 o'clock, it was very easy for me to share. 9.30 got a little bit harder, but 11 o'clock, we're... We're still going to do it. We're going we're gonna to share some chocolate with some folks. See, this is the benefit in a United Methodist Church by sitting in the front row. See, you get chocolate when the pastor comes down. I'll, I'll come take care of y'all too. You know, some days you just get no respect around here. You know what I mean? So there we go. There's a little, little chocolate for folks. So you can take one and pass it around to your... Thank you so much for being here today. Y'all have been great. We're going to be late getting out of here today, but it's okay. This is for a good reason. Thank Share you, chocolate. So I, I knew a lady one time that when she would go out to eat, she would always order dessert first. And I asked her why. And she said, because a lot of folks get full on the entree and they don't have room for dessert. And she, Bob stuck out both his hands. <laughs> oh, that's right. It's his birthday today. Tell him happy birthday. And so she would always order dessert first so that she could get full on dessert. And that tragedy of being full from the main entree would never befall her. So, here, I'm, I've run out of arms. Y'all can take that around and pass. That basket's almost gone. Um, so, today, I shared some chocolate with you all, and it looks like I'm going to end up sharing all of it. But it, this morning when I shared, I still had plenty left. Sharing wasn't hard. I still had some. But what if, what if I only had one piece left? I'll give it back to you in just a second. What, what if I had just one piece left? Would it be easy to share at that point? Maybe, maybe I would pick who I shared it with or who I didn't share it with. Maybe I would break it in half so that I could still have some for me. There you go, Bob. You're a good man. God bless you. Happy birthday. And so sharing out of abundance is easy. Sharing out of scarcity is a little bit different. So I want you to take a moment this morning and just think about the last time you shared when your resources were limited when your resources were scarce. For Debbie and I, that happened shortly after we were married. The year, last year of our engagement, Debbie lived in Kentucky and went to seminary, and after we got married, I moved up there and I joined her. So we're newlyweds, we're living in this tiny little duplex in Nicholasville. I'm working as the general manager in a retail store. Debbie's working part-time at the seminary that she's attending. So as you can imagine, our budget was not plentiful. But it worked. And one of the things that was in our budget, we had decided at the very beginning, right off the top before taxes or anything else, we were going to tithe off that, well, our income. And so the first thing we did when I got paid, when Debbie got paid, is we'd write that check to the church, and then we'd go and we'd write all of our other bills and pay those. Well, one particular Sunday, it was tithe Sunday for us. I'd gotten paid the Friday before. We had sat down, wrote the check to the church, wrote out the check to all the other bills that we had coming up in the next two weeks, filled our cars with gas, went to the grocery store and got groceries for two weeks. And when the plate came across the pew and I dropped that check in, that represented the last money that we had for two weeks. But I thought, you know, we have a budget. We've done everything we're supposed to. It's going to be fine. And so I put it in the plate and let it go on down the pew. 
Well, the very next day, Monday morning, I'm at work, and Debbie calls me in a little bit of a panic. And she said, my academic advisor just found me and got a hold of me. There's a class I need to graduate. There's only a few spots left, and I need to sign up for it today. And my first thought was, okay, go sign up for it. And she said, well, there's a caveat. I said, what's that? She said, they need $250 from me today to mark my spot. It was a chaplaincy in a hospital. And I said, okay. Um, so the, the thought started running through my head. If she doesn't do this, I'm going to have to stay another six months at least in Kentucky. <laughs> Folks, I was born in Tampa. It's cold in Kentucky. It snows in Kentucky. It snows on Easter in Kentucky. And so the last thing I wanted to do was spend any more time than I had to in Kentucky. I wanted to come home. But I told her, I said, write the check. I'll support you in doing that. We'll figure something out. And we got off the phone. Well, the next thing I remember was just, you know, something about the, the, the world started spinning, the darkness started closing in, uh, you know, weak at the knees, all of that stuff. And so I prayed. You know, I think about in moments like that where we give out of scarcity, that it creates a whole different mindset in us. You see, in that moment, my first thought was not how had the money that I had given the day before, how is it going to benefit the kingdom of God? How is it going to be in mission to people that did not yet know Christ? How is it going to support people that had nothing and, and needed something? My thoughts were, where am I going to be? What about me in this moment? That I might have to do something, stay in Kentucky, that, you know, honestly, at worst, was going to be a mild inconvenience. My thoughts went to, well, if I had known this yesterday, I may not have written that check and I'd have, I'd have held on to it. We'd have made it up, but I'd have held on to it till money was a little more abundant and then we would have given it. You see, fear was guiding all of my thoughts, my perspective in that moment. You know, giving of our resources when they're plentiful creates different emotions in us than when we do it from a point of scarcity. And if those feelings of scarcity, the fear, are permitted to become our norm, the pinnacle of our focus, then we run the risk of straying farther and farther away from God, of letting fear take over. But I'm here to tell you today, as disciples of Christ and children of God, we have hope. Because the opposite of fear is generosity. Perhaps one of the most recognized ways that we have seen that self-centered, fear-based lifestyle come to be is in the story that Don read for us this morning. It's only found in the Gospel of Luke, and it's the story of Zacchaeus. And I don't know about you, but as Don was reading it, I was singing, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. How many of you all you remember that? I was singing that song in my head. Thank you, Don, for keeping me focused. And you read the story of Zacchaeus. He was a known tax collector. And not only was he a tax collector in that region, he was given permission by the occupying military force that if he continued to support them and raised money for them, that he was given permission to collect as much as he thought was necessary over and above what was required. And that's what he did. And so you can imagine this, this made him as a not a very liked person among his kin. They felt betrayed. They felt abandoned by Zacchaeus. But this is what he did. And there was a whole host of things that he did to justify it in his mind. But you know what the kicker is? You know what Zacchaeus means? The name? Innocent. Didn't fit this time, did it? Now one day Zacchaeus made a bold choice. He heard that Jesus was coming through town and he made the decision that he was going to go and see this man. And so he went out and he found Jesus and the scripture story tells us that he goes out and he climbs a tree to try and see him because Zacchaeus was a what kind of man? A wee little man. But he has this purpose, this desire to see Christ. You see, this choice changed his life forever. It prompted this man to turn from his old way of living, commit to return his fraudulent earnings fourfold, and furthermore, to give half of his possessions to the poor. Now, Zacchaeus could have been content with his lifestyle and never sought out Jesus. 
Zacchaeus could have rationalized his behavior in a myriad of ways. He could have even convinced himself that what he was doing fit the letter of the law somehow was okay for him to do what he was doing. And even if Zacchaeus did seek out Jesus, he still could have returned to his old ways after the fact, after the encounter. But he didn't. He was changed. He offered to give back four times what he had taken from others and half of what he had to the poor. It was in this encounter with Christ that Zacchaeus made a shift from everything being about him and what he had and what was enough to being about other people, putting others above himself, from living in a place where his focus was internal to living in a place where the focus was external. From living a life based in fear and worried about what he had to living a life that overcame that fear, living a life of generosity. After this encounter for Zacchaeus, it was no longer about taking. It was about giving. That was the shift that changed his life. It's it's the shift that you and I are called to make as disciples of Christ, as children of God. A shift from an internal perspective to an outward one. Now, finances are are an easy example to look at. But when I talk about a shift like this, and in this moment, what I'm talking about is all of our time, all of our talent, all of our gifts, all of our resources, all that we are. We are called to give all that we have, all that we think, and all that we do over to the one that created us. It helps give us a, a bit of perspective about what life could look like when we do that. And I know sometimes in churches we get, we get bogged down in the, the church examples, the church missions, the church activities. But folks, this perspective of giving applies to all aspects of life. There's a comedian that took this to heart, and I have a clip that I want to show you this morning. Take a look. People ask me all the time, Michael, what was your big break? Our next guest has performed on Comedy Central's Premium Blend. He made his first appearance on The Tonight Show from the Montreal Comedy Festival. You've seen him on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. That wasn't a big break. The big break was at a club. And right before I got on stage, I had a change in mindset about comedy. Normally when a comedian gets on stage, he wants to get laughs from people. And I felt a little shift take place where I felt like I was to go up there and give them an opportunity to laugh. Now I'm not looking to take. I'm looking for an opportunity to give. This changed everything. I leave the club that night, and there's all these people giving me hugs and high fives, telling me their favorite jokes. Then I look across the street, and I saw a homeless guy. And I thought to myself, what about him? Most comedy, most jokes are set up. My son, four years old, looks at me out of nowhere. And he says, Dad, I want to be a doctor. I was like, yes, yes. And then a punchline. Then he said, or a dinosaur. I understand that me doing comedy and doing all of these TV shows and making all these people laugh is really just a setup. My punchline is to make laughter commonplace in uncommon places. We go to Montrose, Colorado, a place called the Dolphin House. They take care of children who have been abused by their parents. And this grandmother explains to me that her um, grandson is being abused by his mom. He's so afraid of his mom that everywhere he goes, he wears a Spider-Man costume. So I get on stage, sitting right up front, Spider-Man. I start doing comedy. People start laughing, slowly but surely. Probably about 25 minutes into it, I hear a voice And the voice says, my name is Ronan. And this little boy pulls off his mask. And it was one of the most powerful moments in my entire comedy career. Here's the deal. If we could just stop asking the question, what could I get for myself? And start asking the question, what can I give from myself? I think people would learn that you don't have to be a comedian to deliver a punchline. It's really what I want to get across to people. And I think I just did. From the world of comedy, a perspective shift of not receiving but giving, of finding a way to provide joy for other people. And folks, this can be in any aspect of our lives. 
I love the line at the end where he says, if we can stop asking ourselves, what can I get for myself, and instead ask, what can I give from myself? That changes our starting point. That changes our foundation. It changes everything about what we do now. What we have and what we do is not aimed at only making our lives better and more comfortable. But now we're focused on how to make the lives of others better. Keeping us centered on the understanding that what we have really isn't ours to begin with. We're just entrusted with it. It all belongs to God. And that's just one example. I want to ask everybody this morning here to, to raise your hand. Very simple, just raise your hand. What, now, what you don't know is that this is the answer to a question. Okay, so here's the question. <laughs> Who here has a gift from God and a chance to share it with somebody else? There's your answer. Every single one of us. We all have a gift from God and we all have an opportunity to share it. It will all look different. It will all come from different opportunities and different venues. And I know that was a little bit sneaky, but you, you get what I'm trying to say, right? This world needs you. You have an experience. You have wisdom. You have a, a perspective that somebody somewhere needs to hear, not from anybody else, but from you. God has given you a gift and trusted it to you. And God needs you to use it to build the kingdom in the here and in the now. This world needs you to love the unloved, to welcome in the outcast, to model the way of life that was given to us, commanded for us by Christ himself, to trust in God even when we don't understand and we don't know where God is going. You know, right after Debbie and I hung up, this is the, the rest of that story. I did the only thing I know to do in that moment, and I did. I prayed. And I rambled for a while, but I, I ended up on the sentiment that was some, somewhere along the lines of, I don't know what to do. There's nothing I have to give. I need you to take care of this. I need you, God, to provide the way, because I, I don't have it. Later on that day, several hours later, Debbie called me again, this time in tears. And I'm thinking, oh, dear Jesus, I, I, I can't. And no hello, no hi, but a question. Do you have an Aunt Doris? And I started going through my, my family trees, all the branches, all the twists and the turns, and, and the only one I could come up with was my grandfather's sister, whose name was Doris, I thought. But I had met her once, maybe twice. I'd probably spent a grand total of 45 seconds in her presence in my entire life. And so I said, well, it could be my granddaddy's sister. And she said, well, in the mail today was a letter from your Aunt Doris. That's how she signed it. And she was talking about how her brother had told her that his grandson and granddaughter-in-law were newly married, were moving out of state for the first time, were starting their lives together, were both going to be in the ministry, and just to keep us in her prayers. You see, the note went on to explain what had happened because inside that envelope was a check. And that check was for the exact amount down to the penny that Debbie needed to pay for this class that she found out about that morning. She said she had come into some unexpected money. And when she received it, she didn't need it for anything. And something was, was talking in the back of her mind and said, this really isn't for you, but I just need you to hold on to it for a second. I'll tell you when to give it away. And for some reason, she felt that now was the time that Debbie and I were the people. So she was writing to us asking if we would accept that donation from her. You know, there's a lot of ways we could classify that. We call it luck. We call it coincidence. Good timing. My friends, for me, that was God. That was God reminding me that if I will submit all that I have and all that I am, even when I can't see what's coming, but just trust in God and God's timing that God will provide. You see, in that moment, God was working out the answer to my, I can't do this before I ever knew there was a need. 
Before I ever knew that I was going to have a, a, a shortfall, God was already moving the pieces so that on the day Debbie and I needed it, an answer to prayer arrived. And that's the thing about following God. That's the thing about giving all that we have and all that we are over to the one that can see all things. There is that promise to provide, that promise to be with us in those moments. Now, folks, please don't mishear me. I'm not telling you to go home tonight and pray for a Mercedes. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It's not going to work like that. But you see, God gave me that space to remind me that if I'll get out of the way every now and then, if I'll trust in God and what God is doing and the plan that God has, that God is working things out, that God is, is moving pieces to provide for us no matter what comes our way. My friend, stewardship is about more than just money. It's about how we spend all that we are, our time, our talent, our resources, and our energy. If we only look towards supporting those things that, that we like, that we want, that we desire, if our support is only for those things that, that make us comfortable, that we think we can handle and we can do, how much of God might we miss? You know, if we stay focused only on the, the within and lose sight of all that is God's great big world, God's great big plan, God's great big love for all of humanity what great big thing might we miss? You know, as we move forward to Commitment Sunday next week, I invite you to pray about where God is calling you. Where he's calling you to give of yourself, your gift, and your resources. You see, Zacchaeus made a bold move that day and sought out Christ. And because of that, he was changed forever. And not just changed a little bit, but to a degree where he gave away half of what he owned and returned fourfold what he had taken. There's a great redemption that happens when we submit to God. There's a great transformation when we hold nothing back, give all we can and do so in a way that takes us past our comfort. Because it's in that moment where we get to the end of ourselves and what we can do, that we find the beginning of God. Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Gracious Father, we know that we have the temptation at times to take control, to know the path and to know the plan and to do it out of our, our own strength, our own ambition, our own desire. But you are so much bigger than all of that. You have an ability, you have a, a presence and a power to do things that are far beyond our imagination, that pale in comparison to anything that we have dreamed or envisioned. That's the plan that I want. Not only for me, but for this church and for your world. A plan that exceeds anything that we can envision, that is pales in comparison to what you have already begun to work on. And so this day, in this moment, we give ourselves to you anew and ask that you imbue us with the strength to trust you in all manners, in all ways, and with all things. Give us the courage to follow you even when we, we don't know where you are going, we don't know where you are leading. Give us the strength to stand in that gap, in those moments where we are scared, in those moments where we think we cannot possibly do or go or be what you are calling us to do. Give us that never failing trust. Forgive us for our unbelief. Transform us, redeem us to be those people that you have called and created us to be. We thank you this day for your countless blessings that have flowed out upon us in a never ending stream. And we look forward to everything that you're going to do through us in the future. And we pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all of God's people said,